discussed. Recording in progress. The program includes four talks, each focused on a particular broad area of research where the work of Weinberg led the uh, breakthrough progress. The speakers of the day do not need any introductions since they are very well-known eminent scientists and I'd really like to thank them for accepting to give a talk for this uh, Weinberg celebration. And also I'd like to thank the and GGIT the BREX organizers to, to join with us. whom I'm sharing so every effort to, to make this day a great day, Brexit, especially for the youngest generation of physicists. And, uh, the impact People of are still connecting on Zoom, we physics. are quite a number. Stephen and, Weinberg uh, was a giant. As I, as the I of the theory told of you, uh, for those who were not able to attend, the event is live streamed and you can find in the chat the link. For the live streaming for generations of physicists, um, and uh, it is at the heart. All the infos are in the chat, the yes. And uh, the videos of this the talk work, will be uploaded on the GTI webpage in, in the next days. Uh, quantum field theory and cosmology uh, still form the foundation of, of uh, our understanding of physical reality. I must confess that I did not know how wide uh, was the area of the research covered by Steven Weinberg and the number of topics where he contributed in a seminal way. Of course, uh, everyone knows that he won the Nobel Prize in 1979, which he shared with Lesho and uh, Abdul Salam for his work unifying two of the nature's fundamental forces. In fact, he realized that by applying the Peter Higgs mechanism to the weak force, he could uh, describe in a unified way the electromagnetic and weak interactions. And this became a, a foundation for the current standard model of particle forces. But uh, Weinberg's uh, research touched on uh, many other areas. It's uh, amazing the list of important results that carry the Weinberg, Weinberg name. Just to uh, remind some of them, the Weinberg sum rules, the Weinberg operator, the Weinberg angle, the Weinberg Witten theorem, the Lee Weinberg bound, the Weinberg soft graviton theorem. And uh, in addition, there, uh, there are his uh, groundbreaking contributions which do not carry his name, including the development of the effective field theories and uh, cosmology. This event was to be a celebration. Do you hear me? Maybe they are calling for some problem. I, I hope you hear me. This event wants to be a celebration of Steven Weinberg. His contribution will be put into historical context and its relevance for present day research will be discussed. The program includes four talks. Each focused on a particular broad area of research where the work of Weinberg led the uh, breakthrough progress. The speakers of the day do not need any introductions since they are very well-known eminent scientists and I'd really like to thank them for accepting to give a talk for this uh, Weinberg celebration. And also I'd like to thank the GGIT Brex organizers with whom I'm sharing every effort to make this day a great day, especially for the youngest generation of physicists. People are still connecting on Zoom. We are quite a number. And uh, as, I, as I told you, uh, for those who were not able to attend, uh, the event is live streamed and you can find in the chat the link for the live streaming. Um, all the infos are in the chat, yes, and uh, the videos of the talk will be uploaded on the GGI webpage in the next days. Uh, some details about the organization, we have two sessions of two talks each, divided by 20 minutes of break. At the end of each talk, there will be a Q&A session and an overall free discussion at the very end of the day. Roberto Contino and uh, Enrico Trincherini will coordinate the Q&A sessions uh, and I want to thank them for, uh, for doing this job. Uh, so please write your question in the chat. 
that's all from my side and I invite uh, Roberto to open the session and uh, to make, uh, uh, to clarify other points that maybe I, I forget to do. Thank you again and uh, Roberto, please. So thank you, Stefania. I think you clarified most of the, the, the things. Uh, um, as you say, I mean, uh, the presentation of the speakers will be very, very, very short. Uh, concerning uh, how to to uh, how the, the the event will uh, will will evolve, I, I think we can devote uh, the ten minutes after each talk to the more specific questions on on, uh, on each talk, and then uh, reserve the the more general questions and comments to the to the final discussion session. Um, so <clears throat> the first speaker is uh, is Ricardo Barbieri. So Ricardo is professor of Scuola Normale Superiore in Pisa. Um, he is uh, uh, certainly an expert uh, of uh, uh, the standard model, which is the, the topic of his talk. Uh, the title is The Standard Model of Particle Physics. He made uh, very important contributions, uh, in particular regarding precision tests of the standard model, uh, where he's uh, an expert. Um, he is also uh, very well known uh, for his uh, work on naturalness uh, of the standard model uh, as a, an effective field theory. And also he, he worked uh, and made important contributions on flavor and CP violation. So please, Ricardo, you can start. Thank you very much. Um, I suppose uh, I have to share the screen, right? Yes. Is that fine? Yes, perfect, thanks. Very good, very good. So, well, uh, for, for uh, what has already been said about Weinberg, I am very, very glad to be able to give this talk, in particular in, on the standard model, because uh, I believe that the standard model uh, in its present form or in some modification of it that uh, may, may arrive, uh, is one of the main achievements ever in the physical description of reality, or at least in an important quadrant of it, uh, constituents and forces. Uh, now, given that fact, uh, it is not a surprise that it has taken a long time to construct it. Uh, nevertheless, since uh, in fact, I claim that it's more than 100 years, uh, that that has taken, I feel uh, important to go through uh, the story, which uh, I plan to do in the way that you see. Uh, I will uh, spend some time in describing the making of the standard model, which dates they will defend. I will uh, briefly go through the successes of the standard model, and I will also try to deserve some to reserve some time for uh, the future of the standard model because I think that in fact the story is not yet over. Okay, so the making of the standard model. Let me try to reduce my yes. Okay, now uh, before entering into the subject, the broad view and the Weinberg legacy, you see the, 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 the making of the standard model is made, of course, of the content meaning the construction on effective field theory of the weak and the strong interaction, the strong interaction in parentheses, because in fact, this will be more touched by other speakers, in particular, uh, over Georgiai next to me. And then a full-fledged theory of the weak and the strong interaction. But, you know, equally important is to consider the methodology that uh, was used, may, may also made of two, of two different uh, directions, a phenomenological approach, new concepts to agree with experiments, and the search for mathematical logical consistency. Now, everybody of us knows that, that, knows that Weinberg has been a leading actor in B, in constructing a full-fledged theory of the weak and the strong interaction. But in fact, as it will become clear in my talk, I think, um, he, he, he was a leading figure in, in A as well. And the thing that I want to underline most, a master of equilibrium between one and two. 
uh, Weinberg, uh, as it has already been said, but even with respect to the approach, was not has not been a specialist in the best sense uh, of this statement, and uh, I think that this is part of the of his legacy. All right, so. Yes, all right, so um, I, I begin with the, 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 the re really the beginning, uh, you know, the first uh, thing that uh, uh, entered into the game was the realization in experiments mainly in the UK that the, the, the beta decay, the, the beta particles in beta decay had a continuum spectrum that became clear in between 1910 and 1920 uh, generating a, a big discussion, uh, the, 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 even putting forward the possibility that there was a, a, cr a crisis of the energy conservation law. Um, the, as we know, the issue was uh, essentially resolved by the hypothesis put forward by Pauli of his neutron, quote unquote, which was a, a new particle of spin one half. And then uh, what in all respects can be considered as the beginning of an effective theory of the weak interactions is Fermi, Fermi theory, uh, where, uh, allow me a bit of chauvinism, I quote the, the, the title in Italian, Tentativo di una teoria della emissione di raggi beta, which I suppose I don't have to translate for you. And that is the form of the interaction Hamiltonian that Fermi wrote in his very first paper. Uh, you, you recognize everything except perhaps the, the tau plus, tau minus, which were the raising and lowering operator of isospin as uh, uh, people uh, um, uh, were using in describing the, the nuclear interactions. Uh, pretty soon, uh, the, the, the more uh, uh, standard notation uh, was introduced that you recognize with the various uh, Lorentz invariant uh, pieces, and again soon recognized to be problematic this uh, um, uh, interaction Lagrangian in its high energy behavior, because people notice that, the, for example, the cross section for uh, um, uh, the elastic interaction, the quasi elastic interaction, was growing like the square of the momentum of the neutrino or, or, or of the energy. And uh, uh, in fact, uh, in the 60s, uh, gradually reduced to the current, current form that we are all familiar with and that you see written down there. Of course, I don't have to recall you that uh, in the 50s, parity violation was uh, uh, discovered as uh, strangeness was discovered, the various strange particles. Um, the the um, leptonic current was clearly written down in the form that we know now. In fact, including also the muon, which I didn't write down, the question was, what about the hadronic piece? Uh, because uh, uh, nobody had a, uh, a model for the strong interaction. And the, the, the key uh, step that was re re recognized as essential to go forward was to associate the uh, current described in the strong interaction with the symmetry of the uh, of the strong interaction, because that would, uh, would, would have allowed to make consideration um, uh, to some extent model independent. So in 58, uh, one put forward the conserved vector current, essentially the identification of the vector piece of, the, of H mu with the uh, isospin uh, uh, charge current, which made possible to establish beta decay and mu decay universality, because that observation allowed a normalization of the current and of the matrix element, and uh, people were able to realize uh, the uh, universality with beta decay and mu decay. Uh, the the um, axial part of the current was more of a problem, but uh, in 1960-62, in uh, and people introduced the concept of uh, um, partially conserved uh, axial current, chiral invariants spontaneously broken, pions perhaps as numb Goldstone bosons. And uh, 
In 62, in fact, uh, uh, one of the first important uh, um, contribution of Weinberg to this specific area was a, a paper written with Goldstone and Salam showing that, uh, in general, pretty general terms, that the continuous symmetry and the non-invariant vacuum give massless scalars. Uh, at the end of the paper, uh, in fact, uh, the question was raised as to whether this had to be considered at the, as a difficulty, because after all, nobody had seen uh, massless scalars. And we will see uh, how this will, uh, will, uh, will, will, will go forward. 63, a, a fundamental step by Kabibbo, who essentially enlarged the SU2 to SU3, uh, the current written a la Kabibbo with the Kabibbo angle, um, is you, you see it written uh, here, right, with the delta S equal zero and the delta S equal one. But the, the most important contribution of Kabibbo was that he understood that uh, by thinking of this current as a piece of SU3, it would have been, it was possible to make a quantitative comparison of uh, all the um, strange particle decays and indeed show that uh, a, a current like this with the Kabibo angle was capable to um, successfully predict all these decays. Uh, 64, uh, Gelman, uh, uh, enlarge the SU2 cross SU2, if you want, including the observation of Kabibo to U3 cross U3, the algebra of current, as it was called at the time, uh, which one can see it as a product of two U1s and two SU3s, broken down to U1 vector cross SU2, SU3 vector. Uh, the uh, axial part of this U1 will have to be the issue of the axial part, the fate of the of the axial part will have to be understood uh, uh, later on. Um, uh, uh, immediately after, Weinberg started giving a series of contributions, more than one paper, uh, in, in, where in his usual style, he translated the algebra of current in a dynamical way of describing their contribution by means of effective chiral Lagrangians applied to ions, baryons, the row even. As you were saying, um, current algebra without current algebra. And um, I, I, I suppose that this will be again covered by over George I, uh, but this is one of the characteristic way in which Weinberg likes to, likes to work, right? writing down most general Lagrangians consistent with the symmetry and see uh, the general uh, consequences of those Lagrangians. Now, uh, from the, the phenomenological sort of approach, one uh, passes to uh, a, 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 the steps towards a full-fledged gauge theory. Now, of course, that, that proceeded very much in parallel to, proceeded very much in parallel to excuse me, yes, to, to the, the phenomenological approach. Um, of course, everybody knows the story of, of, of U1 electromagnetics, of, of QED, um, and also of speculation that took place in that period about SU2 of isospin as a possible gauge theory, uh, often derived from a five-dimensional theory, interestingly enough. Uh, a, a major step was made in... Uh, 1954, everybody knows, Young Mills gauge theory was written down for SU2. And in connection with the, the, the phenomenology of the weak interaction, a, an important step by Schwinger that uh, started um, rewriting, if you want, the interaction Hamiltonian in, the, in a way that is more, uh, uh, to, to which we are more accustomed to, and even uh, trying to discuss the, the inclusion of a full triplet of vectors that he called Z, Z, Z plus minus, uh, and, and, and the neutral and, the, and the, the zero component in a triplet of SU2, uh, trying to identify uh, the zero component with the photon. Um, yes, now the, the other steps, uh, very important that, and also very well known, that, that uh, uh, nevertheless is worth recalling, is 
um, Glashow that was the first to write down the, as far as I can tell, the, 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 the algebra of the generators of SU2 cross U1 as a, 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 the important generators of the gauge symmetry of the electroweak interaction, and even introducing the notion of uh, a superposition of uh, the, the, the two neutral components here uh, in, in such a way as to uh, uh, construct the photon. Uh, of course, a major question at that point was where the vector masses were coming from, uh, not to mention the issue of including strangeness and so on and so forth, but uh, 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 this was certainly a major step. In the same year, um, I think uh, 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 Glasho and, and, um, and uh, Gelman, I think, uh, extended the, the SU2 of young Mills to an arbitrary algebra, started talking of, of and thinking of a possible unification of all the interaction into a single uh, compact group. Uh, the other major steps that we all know about is um, the Braut and Glert X mechanism with no massless particle anymore, but a massive scalar. And this, uh, of course, is uh, uh, the major, a major step forward that uh, I think Weinberg was perhaps the first to realize, realize how important it was, given the fact that uh, he had suffered the problem of massless particles, according to the, the, the Goldstone Salam Weinberg uh, paper. Okay, so we are at 1967. And uh, the title of the paper that uh, I suppose many of you know and have written we, and, and have read, uh, which uh, whose title was A Model of Lettons. Now, um, I copied, I liked to copy the, 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 this equation from the paper. You see, four is the, 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 the number, the quote of the, of the number of equations in the paper because uh, you will agree with me if I say that it's not frequent that nowadays you can take an equation from a paper which is uh, uh, 50 or, seven or 60 years old and use it, for example, when you give a lecture on the subject. This is the uh, explicit complete Lagrangian for the electroweak interaction, uh, at least for the leptons. Now, uh, which were the important steps that Weinberg realized in that paper? I think the use of spontaneous symmetry breaking, as you do cross U1 into U1, at least in three different directions. First of all, used for the first time in weak interactions, right? As I said, the spontaneous breaking of a symmetry at, was already discussed in the context of a strong interaction, but this is the time in which this, this spontaneous symmetry breaking is used in the context of the weak interaction. Of course, in generating vector boson masses and in the paper, you find the correct uh, um, lower bounds that given the, 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 the knowledge at the time, you could draw on the mass of the W and the mass of the Z. Uh, you see the mass of the W had to be greater than 40 GeV um, of course, these numbers exactly reflect the knowledge of GF at the time. Uh, the, the correct number are uh, perhaps 5 or 10 percent lower, but essentially correct. The, the lower mass of the mass of the W uh, is obtained by taking G equally. Nobody knew uh, which was the value of the of the what will be called the Weinberg angle or the weak mixing angle. Okay, so you could have taken whatever you wanted for this coupling. So G equal E, G prime going to infinity gives the lower bound on the mass of the W and G equal G prime equals square root of two E gives the lower bound on the mass of the Z. Uh, I, I must say that this lower bound uh, were not taken immediately seriously by several people uh, working on the, on the subject. And of course, the other major step, new, new step is uh, use of spontaneous symmetry break in generating fermion masses, as you see it from here. The, the, as you see it from here, the Yukawa coupling 
of the Higgs field with the fermions. Uh, in the paper, uh, Weinberg asks, uh, is this model renormalizable? He, he guesses that it could be the case, but of course, uh, one had to wait the rigorous proof of, of Toft and Weltman that came uh, a, a little time after. Now, of course, the, the other question that remained uh, open uh, uh, during, uh, uh, at, the, uh, uh, at the end of the paper was how to include hadrons. And uh, uh, the, the, the inclusion of hadrons, of hadrons took place uh, in, uh, in between 70 and 73 with, first of all, a, 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 the, 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 the fundamental step that finally understood how to take care of uh, neutral current, uh, uh, strangers changing, changing neutral current. You see, uh, it's pretty clear that the reason why uh, uh, quarks or, or hadrons were not included here is because of the fact that one really didn't know how to deal with uh, the, the problem of neutral current, strange, strange ch changes, ch changing neutral currents because already several years earlier, it was pretty clear that uh, in del from, from bounds on uh, this process or, or, or from uh, the, the mass difference, K0, K0 bar, uh, to make sense of delta S equal one and delta S equal two, one would have needed a cutoff of the, of the um, uh, effective which interaction pretty low uh, two, two, three GV, significantly lower than the, the number that I gave you for the masses of the W. And of course, the solution came with the observation of Glasho, Iliopoulos, and Mayani that the current, the Kabibo current, which is this uh, first piece, had to be completed with the inclusion of charm and the orthogonal combination of strange and D. Okay. Uh, then, of course, uh, the, 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 the major steps in the strong sector of the um, full theory, uh, um, Gross, Wilczek, uh, Pulitzer, uh, asymptotic freedom observation, and uh, not less importantly, um, Gelman, uh, uh, Fritsch, uh, Bardin, Lloyd Wheeler, that uh, starts speaking of colored quarks coupled to an octet of gluons. Now, in, the fr in front of this comes the Weinberg synthesis in a paper that is really worth reading. You know, th that's the usual uh, ability of Weinberg of putting everything together in a fully consistent theory, right? He, you know, in, in, in a paragraph, in, a pagra in not more than a pagra paragraph, he says, you know, the, the, the way to include in, into the, the, the theory that he had already written of as you took Rossi one, the strong interaction had to follow this path. The full group had to be the product of uh, the group for the strong interaction times as you took Rossi one. The fermions had to form non-chiral refs of uh, the, the strong group in such a way that uh, um, uh, respecting the strong group, the, the masses of the fermions could be given. And the third important feature is that scalars are GS neutral so that the, the, the vacuum expectation value of the scalar leave GS unbroken. And that's, uh, as I think you, you understand, is, the, is the, 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 the essence of the full story. Uh, in the paper, Weinberg's ask, Again, in his old typical style, another crucial question. Why the weak interaction do not produce parity and strangeness violation of order alpha, not of order one over, uh, not of order uh, GS, one over MW square, of order alpha? And the answer comes uh, uh, by simply writing down the most general dimension four, up to dimension four, um, up to dimension four, uh, Lagrangian for the effective uh, strong interaction uh, where uh, this Z could contain a gamma phi where this M, which is a matrix, right? We are in flavor space even, the strangeness included here, okay? So Z is a matrix, one plus a, a matrix 
times gamma phi in flavor space, including strangeness, and uh, uh, similarly for them. Now, uh, this is the most general Lagrangian you can write down, and one Weinberg notices that by psi definition, parity and strangeness are accidental symmetries of the strong and the electromagnetic interactions because by uh, psi definitions, the gamma phi, you can get rid of the, of the gamma phi. Uh, anomalies are uh, another uh, subject, okay? So you see, I am uh, um, at the end of the first part. Um, I find useful to show this page, which emphasizes the synthetic character of particle physics. You can write down all of particle physics, provided you know the rules of the game, provided you know what field theory is, you can write down all of particle physics in one page by specifying the symmetry group, by specifying the particle content, how they transform under the symmetry group, and by stating that all operators included in the Lagrangian have to be dimension less than or equal to four. Now, of course, this page, which I repeat, I like it very much because it emphasizes the synthetic character of the standard model, is not does not put uh, the theorist out of business, right? Because the theorists uh, af af after that have to work a lot to get the, the, the consequences. And in fact, there's been, you know, very important research that is still going on and is still essential to give exact meaning to this page. But this is um, the, the, the synthetic description of the standard model. And I will come back to this issue of the synthesis of the standard model. Okay, so, let me uh, let me go to the the, the, the second part. The, I may briefly, right? Because um, you know it would take a, a series of lectures to describe all of the amazing success of the standard model. 1974. Now, um, up to now. Uh, well, of course, uh, you know the the, the 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 first great discovery that. Uh, uh, put, the, put the, 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 the standard model in business, the, weak, the electroweak part of the standard model in business was the discovery of neutral current. Uh, Weinberg at the end of 71 wrote a paper in which um, he noticed that given the, the, the poor knowledge that uh, he had at the time of the, of the mixing uh, angle, of the weak mixing angle, of the Weinberg angle, whatever you can call it, he uh, put a bound, a lower bound, and the upper bound on the uh, uh, neutral current versus charged current interaction of the neutrino. Uh, in fact, uh, having to find at that time with a upper bound uh, coming from CERN pretty close to this lower bound. So um, uh, Weinberg. Uh, uh, you know, was hoping that his, his theory was right and he insisted on that. And in fact, at the end of 73, 74, um, the, uh, the Gargamel, uh, the, the bubble, chamber, uh, bubble chamber operating at CERN, of which you see here the, 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 the actual uh, uh, bubble chamber uh, that you can see in the, in the CERN, uh, 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 if you enter the CERN site, uh, th this is this is the result that was given for the for the uh, neutral current to charge current uh, uh, ratio of the neutrino, consistent with the with this uh, with this uh, prediction. And in fact, this is an historical plot that you can find in the paper in which. Uh, you see the, the expectation depending on the mixing angle and the, the consistency of the result with the, with the expectation. Now, of course, the other major uh, success of the standard model is the progressive discoveries of all the expected particles. And here I have photographed the situation in 73 when all the ingredients of the standard model, that's why I indicate 73, right, as the the, the, the end of the making period, right, were, uh, were there, including uh, CPV if three families, uh, the, the observation of uh, uh, Kobayashi and Mascar, right, even though, uh, you know, the discussion 
uh, on the gauge group, the, the discussion in particular on the origin of CP violation went on uh, in, for, for all the 70s and even later, right? But it's true that uh, uh, all the ingredients that we now think are important in the standard model were known in 1973. And these, so these were the particle known. Uh, all the dates are experimental dates with the exception of the one in color. You, you understand why I put 1905 for the photon. Uh, one can discuss the date at which uh, uh, quarks were quote unquote uh, theoretically discovered. Um, of course, quarks were, were introduced earlier than that, but uh, you know, at the beginning more as, as uh, theoretical entities and so on and so forth. So roughly speaking in the sixties, uh, the quarks entered into the game and uh, here, of course, is the, 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 the situation in uh, 2012, uh, where, you know, it is interesting to look at the dates. Uh, for those of you that don't know them, uh, you see that the 70s have been very, very important and crucial, but, uh, you know, even the other particles that have to wait for an explicit discovery, and they let you guess why I have put these stars here. Now, precision in QCD, well, just one slide. Uh, this is really remarkable. As you see here, the consistency uh, fixed only by one parameter of all the measurements uh, of the uh, running uh, strong coupling constant. Uh, that allows to fix the value of the alpha S2 at, at, the, at MZ with the precision that is better than 1%, as you, as you see from here. Now, why have I written here Sterman and Wine? Because you see, not all, but many of the, of the, of the centers here come from jets. And uh, uh, Sterman and Weinberg dictated the, the, the philosophy that then you know, uh, produced the continuous interaction between theorists and experimentalists, uh, how to define jets in an optical way, but the basic observation is simple. Uh, whenever you define a, an observable that is infrared free and there's a typical momentum that is say above, uh, uh, say two, two GV, then you can compute the perturbation theory without making any reference whatsoever to the part of model or whatever, right? So that was the observation of Weinberg that is, has been instrumental in constructing this, uh, this, uh, uh, this, uh, this plot. Uh, not less important is the uh, electronic sector. I, I suppose that many of you have seen uh, uh, this plot, uh, which uh, puts together all the, all the observables essentially at the Z and, the, and, and the, at the W pole, but it's worth having a, a look at it. Uh, so you see there are five entries, the, 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 the red entries are, are, are inputs, right? Corresponding to five, uh, the five uh, uh, parameters that are important in the standard model that you all recognize, I suppose. Then there are three green observables that are related to chart current and then several observables uh, related to uh, neutral currents, the, the uh, Z-pole observables essentially, right? And the important thing is that each predicted observables in this feed is removed from the feed, right? So this is a real prediction. Uh, it's worth, I think, uh, uh, commenting uh, again on the, on the precision of the electroweak feed. This is a, a, a plot that you may, many of you may have seen, but it's worth uh, uh, looking at it, right? So uh, you see this, uh, uh, this uh, blue uh, ellipse, right, is the uh, prediction of the mass of the W and the mass of the top using the electroweak uh, um, observables that I have described before compared with the direct measurement. And as you see, the level of consistency. Why this is important? You see, this is important because it is literally true, and I will even come back to this, uh, that the standard model is not capable to predict the mass of the top and the mass of the W. Nevertheless, it is true that there are many observables that are correlated by this parameter. In particular, all of the electroweak feet correlated uh, through, among themselves through these parameters. 
which meant that in 1994, before the discovery of the top, the top, the, the top mass could be uh, uh, essentially predicted, quote unquote, in this way, right, in this way. And in 2012, in fact, already at the end of lab in the year 2000, the mass of the X could equally be uh, predicted, right? Uh, another way to, to see the, the, the impact of the electroweak interaction is by using these uh, two uh, effective parameters that uh, uh, are capable to catch all the electroweak corrections, the typical gauge corrections, loop gauge corrections, um, for all the Z-pole observables and the W-pole observables, not only in the standard model, in fact, but for any theory that is uh, um, flavor symmetric and quark uh, lepton symmetric. And, uh, uh, um, you know, this uh, is what uh, led, uh, I think, the majority of us to think at the end of the lab, at the end, and at the end at lab, that the gauge sector of the standard model had been established, and this I think is important, and we'll come back in the in the following. Uh, the the last plot that I want to the page the slide that I want to show on the on the um, uh, test of the standard model is this page, which I call the ultimate precision, which shows the comparison between theory and experiment in the G minus two of the electron, uh, of the anomaly of the electron and the anomaly of the muon. Uh, never mind uh, the, agree the level of agreement at the moment, uh, I, I will even say something later on uh, on, on this. Um, the important thing to notice is that uh, you see the level of, the level of comparison is, is the level of, of, of er the error is the level of one part per billion here and in the in the muon at the level of one part per million. And again, Weinberg, Jakiv and Weinberg in 1974 were the first to compute the one loop weak correction to the G minus two of the muon. Now, I hope you will forgive me if I if I have included this uh, sketch, but I, I, I put it there because uh, um, I, I reminded me of the fact that uh, I use, I, I normally use a page like this when I give a talk to, to high school students about uh, particle physics, because in fact, I think that the, the, the collection of this page and the page about the synthetic nature of the standard model to me is the most uh, uh, synthetic way of presenting the, the power of the standard model uh, in all is, Respects. Uh, yes, I, I here 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 is again the issue of the synthetic nature of the par particle physics. Uh, once again, in a way that uh, I, I, I am sure you are familiar with, uh, uh, Weinberg would say, uh, as said, the world of physical phenomena reduced to a finite set of fundamental equation principles. That that was his way of thinking in terms of uh, reductionism, right? Now, I, I, these data I think are, are important. I told you already, uh, you know, the dates are the approximate dates of the ex experimental test of the various lines at different levels, right? This is the, the, the A sector. And uh, I, I, as I told you, the end of lab showed that the basic structure was correct. Uh, the X, uh, uh, the, the, the test of the X started with LEP, essentially, right? And with the incredible uh, uh, important, importance of the discovery of the X. And, but I think that is still going on, as I will uh, uh, argue in a second. And uh, uh, of course, the flavor uh, uh, bit, right? With, uh, you know, a construction that started with Kabibo and so on and so forth. But in terms of tests, uh, it seems to be that the, 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 the key year is the year 2000, uh, when at least one possible first year is the year 2000, when uh, one first saw um, direct CP violation in the Kern system. For those of you who remember this uh, notation, the epsilon prime over epsilon first observed to be different from zero, as expected in the standard model, first at CERN, and then 
uh, in the US, uh, and again with the, the uh, testing that goes on. All right, so uh, I, uh, how much time do I have, uh, Roberto? So how much time do you need? <laughs> we... uh, five minutes. Five minutes, okay. Okay, now the future of the standard model, uh, you know, is there a difference in the two sectors of the standard model? So I am brief, right? Uh, um, I, here there is a little reordering of the of the gauge sector and the X sector for reason that I have explained. The, the, you know the gauge uh, the, the gauge coupling of the X cannot be doubted. So uh, the, 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 this slight uh, reorganization, right? And uh, you know it is a fact that many of what can be considered problems in the uh, of the standard model are in the X sector. The hierarchy problem, you know, you know, you all know what I mean. The uh, the cosmological cost, constant problem, which you may say it's not really a problem from the standard model, but in fact, from an effective field theory point of view, they they look very much the same. These two problems, and then the flavor problem, uh, which means that the combination of this and this makes that no particle mass is calculable in the sense that I said. Uh, with, with the um, qualification that I said, there is no particle mass except for the photon and the gluon that is calculable in the standard model, which makes me think that this is a legitimate question. Can we tell for sure that we know the true nature of electroweak symmetry break breaking? Of course, I agree. This is a pretty conservative question, yes, but in science to be conservative is uh, meaningful and um, you know, maybe this is a, the, the, a question for, put forward by an old man, as I am, but I think that it makes sense. Uh, also, because, you know, based on this comparison, uh, here you see the, 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 the calculation of the, the you know, the, the, the measurement of the uh, various coupling of the X, uh, typical precision 5, 20% against the precision in the electroweak test at the level of one per mil, okay? Which makes me think that uh, this and the previous page make it that a X factory is due to what? To, to, to the cultural evolution of mankind. Best, of course, if it's on the way to a high energy collider. This seems to me one important step that should be taken in the uh, future if we want to really understand the true structure of the standard model. And we know the, the reasons uh, would we'll take a seminar. Even this page, you probably know, right? The problem of question for the standard model, the issue of ne neutrality of, uh, of, the, of the issue of ne neutrality of, the, of, of hydrogen, right? That, uh, that uh, um, you know, cries for some sort of unification. And of course, here I, I, I underline again the contribution of uh, uh, Weinberg, who together with Georgia uh, Ellen Queen, uh, first showed how the evolution of the coupling constant could lead to unification. Of course, there are phenomena which are unaccounted for, we know. There is the issue of why there is apparently one single uh, uh, operator in the standard model, according to the rule that I have given before, that needs to be that, that doesn't seem to be there. You know, you know the story of actions, you know the story, the contribution of Winder to that. Why only D less than or equal to four operators? Neutrino masses, proton forever. Weinberg made the full list of the operator in 1979, making a lot of important uh, observation. And then of course, lack of calculability, as I said already. Now, there are current anomalies in the, in the um, in the test of the standard model. And this is a partial list, which however, is not badly chosen, I think. They, they, uh, except for the muon G minus two, they all refer to semi-leptonic BDKs, uh, charge and neutral. And you see the, that uh, the, there is a consistent displacement of all the neutral current observables in semi-leptonic BDKs with respect to the prediction. As the, it is the case, although with a fewer number of observables in the case of the charge uh, current. 
and we have all we have all order of of the muon g minus two. Now, uh, you know, to comment on this is not really part of the of, of my of the talk, but there are ge general lessons to me which are the following. In many cases, the theoretical prediction is definitely uh, is definitely more precise than the experimental precision, which means that a precision program has to be followed in the coming years in flavor as in flavorless. Uh, physics, right? The, uh, this, I think, is very, uh, a very important step for the next uh, uh, decade, say. If confirmed, and this is an important qualification in my view, but not the subject of this talk, the coherence of BDK anomalies are suggestive of some appro approximate uh, flavor symmetry that plays a role in uh, understanding what's going on here. Uh, and also, uh, you know, independently, uh, to me, the G minus two in of the muon, in case it is confirmed, can be easily interpreted as a first sign of supersymmetry. Of course, if they are roses, they will flourish. Now, uh, the, where is the scale of flavor? Of course, uh, you see, uh, if flavor, we think if flavor is confined to high energy, then um, uh, certainly all of these anomalies will have to go away. Uh, however, it makes a lot of sense to think that new physics in the multi-TV is hidden by a suitable ap approximate flavor symmetry. All right, let me finish by letting, let me make Weinberg speak. Now, Weinberg was not only a great physicist, as it has been said, been said but it was also a great intellectual which meant that he regularly published in the New York Review of Books, among many other interventions, public interventions, a series of articles, all very interesting to read. Here, November 7, 2012, the same year of the discovery of the Higgs, Pub, uh, Weinberg writes a, a, an article whose title is Physics, What We Do and Don't Know. Now, I copy one paragraph towards the end. He says, even so, the standard model is clearly not the final theory. Its equation involves a score of numbers, like the masses of quarks, that have to be taken from experiment without our understanding why they are what they are. Uh, and you can go on. A few paragraphs later, he says, inflation is naturally chaotic, bubble form in the expanding universe, perhaps each with different values, for what we usually call the constant of natures. Then he says, if this is true, then the hope of finding a rational explanation for the precise value of quark masses and other constants of the standard model that we observe in our Big Bang is doomed. We would have to content ourselves with a crude and tropic explanation of some aspect of the universe we see. And you can keep, keep reading, you see, there seems to be a contradiction between these two statements, right? Isn't that uh, the, the normal reaction? I don't think there isn't. In fact, look at the title of the paper, what we do and don't know. The search goes on. Thank you very much. Sorry for having kept you a little bit too long. After us. Thank you very much, Ricardo, for, for the great talk. Okay, so I think we can have now uh, specific questions on your talk, if there is any, so people can raise their hands. I, I would really limit uh, questions now to, to those uh, on specific, specific aspects of, of, of your talk. Otherwise, uh, more general questions or comments can be, can be asked at the end. We have one in, in the chat. Ah, let me see. Eh? I have somehow lost the page. Let me. Yeah, so I can read it for you exactly. uh, if you want. So uh, Jay Harnard is, uh, is asking, can the standard model be used to compute the proton-proton scattering amplitude? And can the standard model provide the range of, of, the, of the string interactions? Strong interactions, sorry. Strong interactions. Um, the, to compute the 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 proton proton scattering proton, proton, proton cross section and provide the range of the strong interactions. Uh, yeah, if you if you put together enough uh, uh, experimental information with the essence of the standard model, you can sure. Uh, why not? Uh, you have to put together 
uh, enough experimental information in a range in which the standard model um, suffers from the fact that uh, um, you know the, the the strong interaction part of it in the low q square in the low q momenta is not straightforward to to analyze uh, uh, but uh, uh, you know very much in the same way uh, uh, but uh, you can uh, certainly uh, end up with a prediction for uh, proton, proton 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 collision and and uh, and the range of the strong interaction yes um, uh, I have shown you, I have shown you, I don't know if you see my screen. Uh, uh, do you see my screen again? We do. Uh, yes. Yeah, we, we do. Yes. So uh, uh, you may remember this page, right? Or this page. Uh, this page tells you that, uh, you know, at lambda equal, uh, what, 200 MeV, uh, the, the, the coupling constant explodes and uh, uh, you have to deal with the problem. Yes, very much. Uh, it shows a few areas that uh, I'm most curious about and that bear the imprint of Steve's uh, unique style. Uh, there are um, there are few physics papers that I read for pleasure every few years. Uh, one of these is uh, Steve. I was an undergraduate probably while I was taking Schwinger's course on source theory. Uh, at this point, what Steve means by a phenomenological Lagrangian is one in which the interaction terms are used only in first order. Uh, having only derivative interactions is crucial because it means that in the chiral limit with massless pions, as the pion energy goes to zero, the amplitude goes to zero unless the derivative is compensated by a pole on an external line. Um, the, um, one of the clumsinesses that um, uh, Weinberg refers to here is the starting point. Uh, he starts from the old linear sigma model of Gelman and Levy, which has the right symmetry, but it does, is otherwise not particularly well motivated and Steve had to compensate by putting in the physical normalization of the axial vector current uh, by hand. <coughs> the other clumsiness is that the symmetry structure is only approximately right. But at least the first order in the pion fields, the pion couplings vanish except for derivative terms, which was the crucial thing. Now here's the fun part. Um, the um, Again, the bold is mine. I, I don't know whether Schwinger already knew about the clever mathematical trick of induced representations that he suggested that uh, Weinberg use, or whether he invented it independently. But the idea is this. Um, to build an induced representation of the chiral symmetry, uh, you construct a chiral transformation on the matter fields as an ordinary isospin transformation by an angle that depends on the pion fields. And then you find a nonlinear transformation of the pion fields that reproduces the full chiral algebra. The chiral transformation is said to be induced from the isospin transformation by the nonlinear transformation of the pion fields. And this can be applied to any isospin representation. So the isospin transformation is then local, depending on, p on position, because it depends on the pion fields, which depend on position. But because the pion fields appear only in the angles of the isospin transformation, they disappear completely to all orders from any isospin invariant term without derivatives. The Lagrangian depends on the isospin of the matter fields without any assumptions about what SU2 cross SU2 representation they are part of. Physically, this means that it's simply meaningless to ask about the chiral transformation properties of the matter fields themselves. And now to all orders, the pion couplings all involve derivatives or explicit uh, symmetry breaking terms. Um, the one of the many things that I love about uh, Weinberg's paper is the deft way that he handles Swinger's 
source theory. Uh, paying homage to Schwinger without noting that Schwinger was not really doing anything interesting at this time. And while it's certainly true that many physicists had pieces of the puzzle that Weinberg completed in this paper, Weinberg deserves credit for expressing the idea so clearly and in such generality. As uh, Ricardo mentioned, generality is Steve's specialty. But why is this the right thing to do? Uh, one, the paper contains a very clear statement of one of the central dogma, dogmas of effective field theory, that field theory um, uh, by itself has no content beyond uh, Lorentz invariance and quantum mechanics. Um, perhaps Nima will uh, amend this for us later today. Uh, but the key point here is that the new idea is that the momentum expansion can explain in what sense non-renormalizable quantum field theories make sense. The momentum expansion is an expansion in powers of the energy and in this case the symmetry breaking parameters and it replaces and systematizes the notion of smoothness of amplitudes that was used in the old current algebra calculations. This is what is referred to as chiral perturbation theory. But more generally, Steve realized that the momentum expansion is the key to doing reliable calculations in renormalizable theories, including quantum loops. Even though uh, there are an infinite number of parameters and an infinite number of counter terms required, only a finite number of them are required to calculate to a specific precision at a specific energy. And when coupled with the momentum expansion, Weinberg's folk theorem about quantum field theory becomes a powerful tool that incorporates information beyond traditional perturbation theory. So the first thing I want to talk about is where did this paper come from? Uh, it's so wonderful. I want to spend a good part of my talk discussing the history that led up to this beautiful synthesis. Uh, one possible source for this history is Weinberg himself. Uh, this is one of many papers written uh, about that history. It's uh, the opening talk at a conference celebrating the 30th anniversary of his Schwinger Festschrift uh, paper. And it's there, there are many similar talks. Here is uh, Weinberg's uh, summary of the pro progression. Uh, the starting point, of course, was Nambu, spontaneously broken symmetry, and so-called partially conserved axial currents. And Steve describes his the progression from Nambu and PCAC through the early work on current algebra to his nonlinear chiral Lagrangian that allows current algebra calculations to be done more easily. And then he suggests that he lost interest until the late 70s when he was inspired by Wilson's work on scaling and condensed matter physics and his attempts to justify quantum field theory to his students. Uh, it's a good story and uh, he writes beautifully as always, um, but it didn't convince me. I, I think there are some very important influences that are left out and I wanted to dig into the history a bit and this talk gave me a good excuse to do that. Um, Nambu's PCAC did not catch on Im immediately. You can see that in the citations uh, to uh, Nambu's paper as a function of year. Uh, initially, physicists just struggled to understand the physics of the Goldstone theorem, the connection between spontaneously broken continuous symmetries and massless particles in relativistic theories. Um, the uh, Steve's paper with Goldstone and Salam, which uh, Ricardo mentioned, was one of many examples, though of course it was a particularly clear and general treatment. Uh, but after the uh, success of uh, Galman Neyman's uh, Eightfold Way and the Kabibo angle, the game heated up and uh, there was explicit discussion of the chiral SU2 crust SU2 and SU3 cross SU3 symmetries, and many applications that depended on the commutator structure. Uh, Steve, as usual, 
considered a very general situation and worked out the current algebra of an arbitrary number of pi ops. Even Steve thought that this was complicated. This is a typical page from this paper. Uh, but one beautiful thing uh, that came out of this complicated mess was Steve's calculation of low energy pi pi scattering. Uh, this calculation gets to the heart of the non abelian Goldstone theorem, and it can be understood very simply classically. Um, uh, Goldstone bosons, a Goldstone boson wave packet is a local twist. Uh, in the vacuum. And at low energies, uh, the interactions go to zero because the packets look very much like the vacuum everywhere, but like slightly different vacua in different places. So, for example, two pi zero wave packets don't scatter from one another because all of the twists of the vacuum are about the same isospin axis and they commute with one another. So, the passing pions can twist and untwist the vacuum, leaving nothing behind. But um, a pi zero and a pi plus correspond to twists in different isospin directions, and the twists don't commute. So now the system is complicated in the overlap region, where one pion twists the vacuum and the other twists it in a different direction before the first one can untwist it. This leaves behind a little region of space with the vacuum twisted in the direction of the commutator, and this spreads to become the scattered fields. And that's the classical uh, Goldstone boson physics behind Steve's um, pi pi scattering calculation. The next thing that happened was that, according to Steve, he was sitting in a cafe in Harvard Square when he uh, realized that he could find a Lagrangian that, when used in lowest order, would reproduce the effects of current algebra in a much simpler way. This was the clumsy approach that I discussed at the beginning of the talk. So finally, in 1967, Steve follows uh, Schwinger's suggestion and constructs uh, a, fully, a fully invariant nonlinear theory using the mathematical technique of induced representations. So the, um, then there's a break. He says that only after a break of nearly 10 years to construct the standard model uh, was he motivated by condensed matter physics and by his teaching to uh, think again about the, um, uh, the problem and then finally tamed the infinite number of parameters and realized that non-renormalizable uh, theories are perfectly renormalizable and the momentum expansion uh, allows one to calculate with them. <coughs> At that point, he replaces the old fashioned constraints on of renormalizability by constraints on the sizes of non renormalizable terms in the effective theor field theory. And uh, this modern picture of effective field theory is born. So Steve's account makes a really good story, but I think it leaves out many important developments that almost certainly uh, influenced his thinking. And I want to uh, show you why I think so. Uh, these include maths independent renormalization schemes, guts, effective theories of the weak interactions, heavy quarks, and perhaps most importantly, the U1 problem. So it's certainly true that Steve was doing other things besides thinking about pions in this period. But not immediately. This was a depressing time for quantum field theory. Uh, Weinberg's model of leptons uh, paper did not make a big splash when it first appeared. I was just a baby at the time, but I remember seeing it when it arrived in my mailbox. And like most everyone else, including, I think, Steve himself, I ignored it 
because it didn't look renormalizable to me and I didn't really know how to make precise sense of it. This shows up spectacularly in the plot of the citations uh, to Steve's paper by year. Um, there was equally little excitement when Glashow and Iliopolis and Miami figured out why uh, a charm quark had to exist to explain the absence of nuclear of uh, neutral current effects that change flavor. Uh, I must say the statement of the gym mechanism is very simple. If there are four quarks and they come in two complete families, each of the identical, each with identical weak charges, the strong interactions have an approximate SU4 flavor symmetry and flavor symmetry, flavor changing neutral current effects are proportional to the SU4 symmetry breaking and can be adequately, adequately suppressed if the symmetry breaking is small. I think this is one of the most brilliant and annoying developments ever in particle theory. The reason that I think it's so annoying is that it implies that we have absolutely no idea what flavor really is. And uh, as Ricardo mentioned, in the standard model, that turns out to be true. At any rate, these frustrations ended spectacularly um, in 1971, uh, after uh, uh, Toth figured out how to make sense of spontaneously broken non-abelian gauge theories in general, and Weinberg's model of leptons in particular. This obviously is the uh, reason for the jump in citations uh, to the Weinberg and Jim papers, and also to the resurgence of quantum field theory in general. Atuf's work opened up a new region in the map of quantum field theories. And some of us started exploring it by building models, both to see what was possible in this new class of renormalizable models and to try to find the right model. So I will discuss one completely crazy uh, model building exercise uh, in detail. Uh, James Birkain, uh, BJ, did something crazy that was both wrong and uh, important. He came up with a numerological relation for the ratio of the muon mass to the electron mass. And he argued, and as far as I know, this is not published, that the relation was correct um, up to uh, just at the level that one would expect if there were radiative corrections. It's right up to order alpha squared. Now, in hindsight, this seems completely ridiculous. But you have to remember that at this time in 1972, there was no tau lepton, and we sure weren't quite sure what to think about quarks. For many quantum field theorists, quarks were still a shorthand for symmetry properties of the still mysterious strong interactions. <coughs> that uh, situation would change like dreams over the next couple of years. But in early 1972, it seemed entirely reasonable to construct models in which mu over me is calculable. At this time, Steve Weinberg was still at MIT, and he got interested in the same problem. So we had a little contest between Shelley and me at one end of Cambridge and Steve at the other to see who could compute the muon electron mass ratio. Although I think Shelley and I came closer to the goal, Steve made theoretical contributions that were much more important. He wrote a paper which described a model of leptons, his second and much less well-known than the first. Uh, it was based on uh, uh, SU3 cross SU3. And he reasoned that in this model, after symmetry breaking, there would exist Feynman graphs like the one shown here that could, that might give BJ's formula. This is a brilliant wrong paper. Uh, Steve's model doesn't give anything like BJ's formula. He missed a counter term, and the electron mass is actually infinite. Uh, Shelley and I showed this and understand how, understood how to fix it by adding another SU3, uh, but the solution was boring because instead of the square root of two in BJ's formula, we got a complicated ratio of heavy vector boson masses. And if we knew all the masses, we'd have a relation, but that didn't seem like much. The really interesting thing about Steve's model is that it is a kind of proto-gut. Uh, the gut-like properties can be seen in a simpler model with only one SU3, with both triplets transforming as threes. The point is that uh, unlike 
uh, SU2 cross U1, but like all gut models, uh, this SU3 model has gauge interactions that we haven't seen. In this case, the uh, right-handed weak interactions involving the top and the bottom components of the triplets. And also weird uh, uh, doubly charged uh, currents involving the bottom two. To get rid of them, Steve invoked what he called super strong symmetry breaking. Um, he uh, added a, an octet scalar field with a vacuum expectation value in the lambda eight direction and uh, gave it a big vacuum expectation value. That breaks the SU3 gauge group down to SU2 cross U1, as we all know from Gelman's SU3. But in this case, it's used in a completely different way to give a large mass to all of the unwanted gauge bosons in this model. So these super heavy gauge bosons um, were constrained more by their virtual effects than by direct uh, bounds on production. Uh, at this point, uh, Steve was certainly not thinking about what are now, now called gut masses. In those days, a few or 10 times the W mass would have been plenty to suppress the unwanted interactions to an acceptable level. Needless to say, at, at, at the time, it was a pretty radical concept because we all still thought of the W and the Z as extremely heavy. To invent things that were heavier still was a bizarre act of genius. Um, the, um, because there's only one coupling constant in the model, sorry, because there's only one coupling constant in the model, the weak mixing angle is also predicted. And it's predicted to be uh, a quarter, which at the time didn't seem very good, but uh, now seems great. But of course, he was ignoring um, renormalization effects because nobody was, which nobody was thinking about at this time because nobody was thinking about really large mass ratios. It's the fraction uh, in this case, uh, ignoring renormalization, the weak mixing angle is just the fraction of the total charge in the group invariant sense that comes from the SU2 gauge coupling right up here. Steve, as he was wont to do, generalized the question. He generalized the issue of BJ's relation into something much more interesting by expressing what we'd done in a symmetry language. What we found was a model in which the most general renormalizable, renormalizable Lagrangian had no mass term for the electron, so that the kinetic energy terms had a chiral symmetry. But the full Lagrangian did not have a chiral symmetry for the electron field, so that the electron gets a mass due to radiative corrections and the mass is finite and calculable because there's no counterterm to absorb the infinite contribution. Uh, Steve recognized that this thing, sort of thing happens frequently in non-abelian gauge theories and suggested that it might be an explanation for some of the approximate symmetries we see in the world. Uh, the issue may require a little explanation. Symmetry, both gauge and global, played an important role in renormalizability from the very beginning. But nowadays, exact global internal symmetries have a bad name in quantum field theory, and we suspect that there may not be any at all. But approximate global symmetries are an obvious and important feature of nature. We knew how to use them by simply assuming that the Lagrangian of the world uh, has a symmetry conserving part that is somehow large and a symmetry breaking part that is somehow small. But this might seem a little artificial if the symmetry breaking small part was governed by a parameter that was in some sense infinite and required renormalization. Steve realized that there were examples of QFTs in which the symmetry breaking term, like our chiral symmetry breaking electron mass, is finite and calculable in, and calculable in terms of other parameters because it's not gen, present in the most general renormalizable theory and therefore no counterterm exists to absorb an infinity. I think that Steve invented the name accidental symmetry for this situation, and I'm almost certainly certain that I heard the name from him. It appears in a footnote in his paper on the subject. Uh, in our solution to BJ's uh, challenge, the chiral symmetry of the electron kinetic energy term in, uh, is a, an 
uh, accidental symmetry. It's an automatic consequence of the constraint of renormalizability. But the problem with these models was that they could not accommodate fractionally charged quarks. And <clears throat> evidence for these from deep inelastic scattering had been piling up. And by this time, it was getting pretty convincing. So the um, after years of um, experimental results, which were very interesting, but not easily theoretically interpretable, the um, deep inelastic scattering from slack was beginning to make sense and to beginning to look like really interesting, though still confusing, quantum field theory. Another interesting thing that happened in this time was that Bouchiat, Iliopoulos, and Mayer, and Gross and Jakeef reminded us that the existence of triangle anomalies put interesting constraints on uh, these model models. And uh, Bim noticed that uh, three colors of quarks was the right number to cancel anomalies in the electroweak uh, model. So this fit very nicely with the original suggestion of three colors uh, from baryon spectroscopy spectroscopy. So after the discovery of weak neutral currents, the basic structure of the electric electroweak uh, interactions was pretty clear, but the nature of the strong force and the full significance of color uh, was still not obvious. Of course, a big part of the push for quarks came from dimensional transmutation and asymptotic freedom. Dimensional transmutation was described by Sidney Coleman and Eric Weinberg in a number in another of my favorite physics papers, radiative corrections as the origin of spontaneous symmetry vacuum. The subject is a version of Weinberg's model that I think is pretty uninteresting, but the paper is a how to do it manual of useful techniques in quantum field theory, the renormalization group, the loop expansion, the effective potential, and much more, written in Coleman's best pedagogical style. Almost in pass passing, they show how renormalization can convert a dimensionless coupling constant into a dimensional energy scale, characterizing the interaction. I didn't realize at first how important this was going to be. The history of asymptotic freedom is complicated, and I'm not going to get into it except to say that I spent a lot of my time during and after 1973 trying to do useful physics with it. At first, though, we were still assuming that we had to break the color symmetry and not yet recognizing the full power of dimensional transmutation. The recognition that color symmetry could be unbroken and the quarks confined developed gradually to many people over that year. And I first heard it from Steve uh, in this uh, paper. Uh, this indeed shows that Steve was thinking hard about current algebra even during the exciting time when we were building. Uh, the standard model. And the paper also contains these speculations about what we now call quark confinement. And that idea was very important to me personally because it got me and Shelley thinking about unifying SU3 along with SU2 cross U1. So I've told the story of the evening that I found SO10 and SU5 guts elsewhere. So I'll skim over it uh, uh, almost <clears throat> instantaneously, <coughs> but <coughs> the um, uh, we I started by thinking about um, the Pati Salam uh, SU two cross SU two cross SU four model. This is a, uh, a a beautiful model, or almost a beautiful model. They uh, discovered something very beautiful and then ruined it. They were probably the first to write down a model with charge quantization that could incorporate, incorporate fractionally charged quarks. Um, and in fact, Brown Pice tells me that uh, ironically, they may have been the first people to write down the full gauge structure of the, of the standard model, which is contained within their model. And I say that this is ironic because having written down the beautiful gauge structure uh, that could explain fractionally charged quarks, they proceeded to do something absolutely gross to it. Uh, they spontaneously broke the color SU3 and the electroweak down U1 down to a subgroup that left the quarks with integral unnumbered charges. 
when we finally understood that it might not be necessary to break color SU3 symmetry at all, and that the massless gluons might be confined, it was easy to, um, <clears throat> to uh, turn this into something more interesting. And um, basically, the first day that Shelley and I started thinking about guts, uh, we thought about it during the day and didn't get anywhere. And then I went home and uh, worked out the structure of the SO10 and SU5 theories in one evening. Um, the idea was you start with Pati Salam um, and get rid of the ugly symmetry breaking. And then you can immediately realize that uh, the SO, uh, SU4 cross SU2 cross SU2 uh, has an algebra that's equivalent to the algebra of rotation groups, SO6 plus SO4. So any idiot would think of combining these into SO10. And the interesting part was that I didn't have to think about what representation to look at. The spinner representation was the unique choice. So the group theory put the quarks and the leptons and the antiquarks all together for me into a single representation. That was something that Shelley and I had been unwilling to do, and that's why we weren't getting anywhere. Uh, in the Pati Salam model, uh, getting rid of the right-handed neutrino broke the symmetry down to SU3 cross SU2 cross U1. And I asked myself what subgroup of SO10 remained after I got rid of the right-handed neutrino. And eventually I saw that it had to be SU5, and then I could do all of the familiar calculations. And um, the um, get the weak mixing angle and everything else. Uh, I now looked at the extra gauge bosons. Uh, that had been, I'd avoided that in SO10 because it was complicated, but in SU5 it was easy. And I drew the relevant diagram, which was clear that it would produce proton decay. And I was devastated. Um, I went to bed. Uh, I knew the proton was stable. <clears throat> but Shelley, when I told him about it the next morning, uh, was more excited about proton decay than anything else. And he was right, of course. Um, we went up to the library and looked up the bounds and found that our uh, super heavy gauge boson using Steve Weinberg's mechanism of super strong symmetry breaking had to be greater than 10 to the 14th GeV. We won't wrote the paper and went on to other things. I stupidly didn't include SO10 in a footnote, which gave Fritch and Minkowski the opportunity to find it independently uh, later on. In the next few years, um, I wrote only two papers on guts. One was a conference report about SO10, but the interesting paper uh, for this conference was the George I. Quinn Wein Weinberg paper in which we computed the renormalizations of the couplings in guts and predicted the proton lifetime. Um, the problem that GQW solved uh, was that the then conventional picture of mass in uh, dependent physical renormalization was very inconvenient in a theory like SU5 with very different physics at very different scales. <clears throat> in principle, um, a, a mass dependent physical renormalization should allow you to evolve couplings from the gut scales to low energies and see the coupling splitting. But in practice, it was a hideous mess. So the key idea was that below the scale of the breaking of the gut symmetry, the leading logarithmic renormalization effects were just what we could calculate in an SU3 cross SU2 cross U1 model. And the unification could be put in simply as a boundary condition at the gut scale. Um, we justified this by appealing to the appelquist carazone theorem and using different uh, mass independent renormalization schemes uh, in uh, different energy re regions. Uh, this was a modern effective field theory calculation, although we did not describe it uh, that way at the time. The couplings in the different regions evolved differently and were connected by matching at the symmetry breaking scale. This was a departure from the conventional view of renormalization as relating directly to physically measurable properties. 
it fit nicely with the tuft veltman scheme of dimensional regularization and minimal subtraction, but only if we supplemented it by an effective field theory idea of different theories in different regions. And that idea is, in fact, absolutely required to make minimal subtraction useful in any theory with multiple energy scales. Uh, I don't have much use for anthropic arguments, but I am enormously grateful to have been born into a universe in which God ha had chosen the parameters to illustrate almost every possible interesting theoretical idea relative to the standard model. Um, and heavy quarks are a great example of that. Um, the, because I'm running out of time, I'll skip over the, uh, the, uh, the details here. But basically, the Parton model was really confusing um, the, initially because the, some parts worked great. Uh, for the uh, uh, deep and elastic electron scattering, but um, it failed badly for E plus E minus. And the, um, when the, uh, many of us were convinced um, by, because we tried everything else, that charm had to exist and that the problem with uh, E plus E minus uh, the E plus E minus parton model was that charm was being produced. Now, um, the uh, uh, when as the um, J psi was being discovered at SLAC, uh, Bert Richter was actually a, a Loeb lecturer at Harvard, giving lectures on his theory that the rising R that they saw in uh, at SLAC uh, was. Uh, due to the fact that the electron was a hadron some fraction of the time. Uh, and um, at a uh, lunch for uh, uh, Bert at the, in the department, uh, David uh, Pollitzer and uh, Tom Applequist suggested that they look for narrow peaks in the data. And of course, Bert ignored that. Uh, uh, the announcement of the JPSI uh, occurred a, a bit shortly thereafter. Um, the um, um, it was actually surprising how long it took to actually see charm, but eventually, um, and the uh, it's useful to remember that half of the explanation explanations of the JPSI in the um, in the famous PRL uh, after the discovery were silly, even things by very famous people like Schwinger. But it ended happily. Charm was eventually discovered exactly where we said it should be. Um, R in E plus E minus was starting to look exactly like Applequist and Hollister said it should. Except, of course, in the meantime, God had thrown us an extra heavy lepton. And in the space of less than a decade, we'd gone from confusion to confidence. And quantum field theory was ascendant. But the interesting point for Weinberg was that we had several new energy scales above a GeV, certainly the charm mass and the W and Z mass, and plausibly a gut scale. And we could no longer ignore the effects of running between these scales. It was becoming obvious that some version of effective field theory was the way to deal with this. And the question was, how does it work in detail? All of this was in the air, and I just don't believe it did not have an effect on uh, Steve's thinking. As far as I know, one of the first people to really figure out the details was my office mate in the late uh, 70s, Ed Witten. And while his um, calculations are not exactly described in the same language that Steve uses, all of the pieces are there. The last piece I wanted to mention is the U1 problem. Classically, uh, the symmetry of three massless quarks has an extra chiral U1, and it is a disaster. Um, nothing would work. It was um, when the, uh, uh, the quarks were not real and were just, uh, you just used them to uh, abstract symmetry properties, you could ignore that problem. 
But that was no longer true as now that the reality of the courts had become more or less established. <clears throat> the, um, and he, in fact, there's a smoking gun here that shows that Steve was thinking about these issues in 1975 during this period where uh, he says he, he wasn't really thinking about it. This is a delightful little paper. Uh, it shows that changing the decay constant of the U1 current can't help very much. Uh, so if anyone was not confused already, this paper would certainly have gotten their attention. But in fact, most people were already confused. And one reason I think that people weren't trying harder to sharpen the tool of chiral perturbation theory was that it seemed it didn't work and that something important was missing. And uh, again, uh, Atuf came to the rescue. After Atuf's paper, there was no reason not to dive back into chiral perturbation theory and really make sense of it. And that's what Steve did. Um, I, I want to say just a few words in the few minutes I have left uh, about after phenomenological Lagrangians. But my main um, uh, message is that everybody should go back and read this paper. Uh, it's just so beautiful. Um, so the legacy of phenomenological Lagrangians goes in many uh, different directions. And many of the most solid and convincing of these go through Baird. Uh, the, uh, I still remember a seminar by Harry Leutweiler Weiler, over 30 years ago talking about the program that he and his colleagues had established to push the phenomenological Lagrangian program further. Harry described their superb work testing the theory, and then he compared chiral effective field theory uh, to an appliance manufacturer and um, the, uh, with some revolutionary pat patents. And he said some, in his talk, he said something like, if you like the refrigerator I just showed you, I have a washing machine and a microwave to sell you. He was referring to the fact that they could use the same technology, not just in particle scattering, but in lattice QCD, in QCD at finite temperature and pressure, in QCD in a finite box, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it was, it's a, a, a beautiful collection of, uh, of applications. Uh, finally, you know, citations can be an unreliable tool because, uh, but because I don't have time or the expertise to discuss all of the many descendants of Steve's work on effective field theory. I've just listed some research papers, not review papers, just new research that refers to Steve's phenomenological Lagrangians paper and which themselves have generated more than 500 citations. Just the titles here show a remarkable story of how far and how widely Steve's ideas have spread. And this doesn't include many influential works that involve effective field theory, but don't involve the chiral symmetry, but they still have their roots in Steve's ideas. So it's an absolutely remarkable leg legacy. And he was a remarkable physicist. And thank you uh, for encouraging me to look into this history a little bit. Thank you. Thank you very much, Howard, for your very nice talk. So there is time for maybe a few questions uh, on your talk. If there is anybody, uh, he can raise, uh, he or she can raise a, a hand. Okay, I don't see any, any question. I don't see any hand. So I, I thank you again. And uh, at this point, we have a, a break, a very short break. So 20 minutes, everybody can, uh, can rest. And then we reconvene at uh, 5, uh, 5, 10 p.m. Uh, Central European time. So in 20 minutes from, uh, from now. Thank you.